organization of sounds. Dear students, when we speak, we might have noticed the different sounds each alphabet creates. It is even more intriguing if you pay keen attention to the way each word sounds. Consider this as an activity. Pay attention to the words I will use now. Bear, bear, night, hello. Did you notice how each word sounds different? Did you also notice how the two words bear and bear sound the same? This is dealt in detail in phonology. Phonology is a branch of linguistics concerned with the systematic organization of sounds in languages. It is concerned with the distribution and patterns of speech sounds in a particular language or in languages in general. Linguists study the language thoroughly, each sound, each rule and simplify several things for us common layman to understand. The building blocks of phonology or the organization of sound. The sound produced by each letter is very important in learning how to enunciate words. The different sounds are segregated into different categories enhancing the perplexity of the language. This is called organization of sound systems or simply organization of sounds. The organization of sound system is considered to be the hidden structure in linguistics. Do you know why? The entire language is based on sound systems. Let us compare it with a building to help you understand better. If the English language is a building, then its foundation is the sound, its bricks are words, its iron is grammar. Do you now see what is the role of the organization of sound systems, that is phonology in the language? Well, in this chapter, we will deal with the organization of sounds or phonology in detail. Phonemes. A phoneme is the smallest contrastive unit of the sound system. It is the nucleus of phonetics. It is the smallest phonetic unit that is capable of conveying a distinction in the meaning of words. Take the words pit and bit. These differ only in higher initial sound. Pit begins with P and bit begins with B, ba. This is the smallest amount by which these two words could differ and still remain distinct forms. Any smaller subdivision would be impossible because English does not subdivide P or B. Therefore, P and B are considered two phonemes. Each phoneme is meaningless in isolation. It becomes meaningful only when it is combined with other phonemes. Phonemes form a set of abstract units that can be used for writing down a language systematically and unambiguously. Next, we will brief through allophones. What are allophones? Some linguists describe it as a driving medium of phonemes. Allophones are defined as the variants of phonemes that occur in speech. The crucial distinction between phonemes and allophones is that substituting one phoneme for another will result in a word with a different meaning as well as a different pronunciation. But substituting allophones only results in a different pronunciation of the same words. Speech. Dear students, we saw a few examples just a while ago. We saw how some words are spelled differently but pronounced the same. Have you not realized now how different spoken languages 
from written language. Written language is too easy compared to spoken language. Speech is an art on its own. Speech is one of the highest manifestations of human intelligence. The way each letter, each word is pronounced is guided by how you use your tongue, lips and teeth. Yes, phonology deals with all this in detail. Let me suggest an activity for you. Have you ever noticed the people who are deaf? Do you know how they judge a word sound? A deaf person pays close attention to the speaker's mouth. He notices how the speaker's tongue, lips, teeth are used. The building block of analogy is acoustic phonetics. So, what is acoustic phonetics? The word acoustic is related to sound. Acoustic phonetics is the study of the sound and its characteristics in detail. That is the study of speech in detail. The main quality of speech is the way it sounds to the human ear. This distinguishes words from one another, letters from one another. Hence, we can now infer that the construction of speech relies on the different sounds. To study each one of them, linguists from all around the world have classified each sound and grouped them based on the sound each set produces. This gave rise to the subject we are dealing with right now, phonology, classes of sound. Students, by now you know that phonology is a very intricate subject. You also know that phonology is basically the organization of sound systems. Let us now see how sound is studied in phonology. Each and every letter makes a sound. The next time you shout, laugh, groan, yawn, sigh and any other day to day activity, notice the sound you produce. Yes, you guessed right. Even this is classified under the several categories and classes of sound. Students, you know the 26 English alphabets that is from A to Z. Now, you would have learnt earlier that in general alphabets are divided into two categories that is vowels and consonants. What are the vowels in the English language? They are A, E, I, O, U. But in phonology sound is classified into more categories. Other than vowels and consonants, they are further classified into semi vowels and diphthongs. Each classification is further classified based on the organ used to produce the sound and the sound that is produces. These are called natural classes. Natural class is defined as a set of sounds in a language that share certain phonetic features. The sound system of every language includes several natural classes each distinguished from other classes by certain features. To summarize, the natural classes of sound are walls, consonants, diphthongs and semi vowels. Walls. Students, what do you think a vowel sound is? It is basically a sound in which there is a continuous vibration of the vocal folds and the air stream is allowed to escape from the mouth in an unobstructed manner without any interruption. How many vowels are there in the English alphabet? 5, that is correct. Now, let me present to you a fun fact. Though there are only 5 vowels, there are 12 vowel sounds that are produced. That is amazing, is it not? What do you think it means? It means that each vowel produces different sounds. So, in total, the 5 vowels produce 12 vowel sounds. Vowels are further classified based on various criteria. Now, I will say the vowels slowly. As I say, each one of them notice the position of my tongue. A, E, I, O, U. How do we distinguish the different vowel sounds with the use of tongue? Vowel sounds can be distinguished from each other by which part of the tongue is involved, front, central, back and also by how high the tongue is when the sound is produced, 
high, mid and low. The height of the tongue refers to how high and low of a tongue is. Thus, I can say that I is a high vowel sound, E is intermediate and the A is low. We may notice the movement of the tongue if you pronounce these three sounds, tongue position. When we make a vowel sound, our tongue is in a specific position inside our mouth. For example, if you make the vowel sound I and then U, you will notice that your tongue moves back. And if you make the sound I and then A, your tongue moves down. The following chart shows the position of the tongue when we pronounce the English vowel sounds. You have to imagine that this chart is inside the mouth. For each sound, there is one phonetic symbol that belongs to the International Phonetic Alphabet. Students, now you know how they are classified based on the height and position of the tongue. But that is not all. Vowel sounds are further classified depending on the usage of lips as well. Vowels may be classified as either rounded or unrounded. Lip unrounded is also called lip retraction. Let me make this seem a little easier by giving you a few examples. The letter O in food, the letter U in put are good examples. Now say the words again slowly. Good. Do you notice how your lips round about? These are called rounded vowels. Now compare the two words food and cheese. When you say food, your lips undergo rounding. And when you say cheese, your lips retract. Vowel sounds are further classified based on the length of the sound. Can you guess them? That is correct. They are classified as long and short. You can use the same two words as we had taken earlier to illustrate an example. Compare the word food and the word bit. Well, yes, you guessed it right. The word food falls under the long category and the word bit falls under the short category. The final classification of vowel sounds is based on the stress given while pronouncing a word. They are classified as tense and lax. Furthermore, they are also classified based on the position of the jaw, consonants. A consonant is a speech sound that is articulated with complete and partial closure of the vocal tract. For example, the letter P. In the English language, there are 25 consonant sounds. We have seen how the vowels of languages can be described in terms of values on a small number of dimensions or equivalently features. In this section, we will see that the same holds true for consonants as well. Languages vary a great deal with respect to how many vowels and consonants, phonemes or sounds they have. But all languages seem to have more consonants than vowel phonemes. Not surprisingly, more consonant dimensions than vowel dimensions are contrastive for languages. Some consonants are produced with a complete closure of the vocal tract, blocking the passage of air. Consonants made by completely closing the vocal tracts are called stops. As we discussed, different consonants can be produced by varying the place where the closure occurs. The consonant dimension is known as place of articulation. Each of these structures is called an articulator. The articulators relevant for place of articulation are the lips, the tongue tip, the tongue body and the tongue root, the pharynx, the region behind and below the oral cavity and the glottis, the gap between the vocal cords. Each language makes use of several places of articulation to distinguish its consonants and phonemes. There are two possible places of articulation involving the lips as articulators. For bilabial place of articulation, the lips are brought together or for non-stops 
as we will see later close together the first and last consonants in the word bib or bilabial stops. A further possible position of the lips is contact between the lips and the upper teeth though hardly used in English with one part or another of the tongue as articulator there is a continuous range of possible places for contract with the roof of the mouth beginning with the upper teeth and extending back to the uvula at the back of the mouth. All languages apparently make use of at least two positions within this range. For English stops, two positions are relevant. One of this is contact between the tip of the tongue and the ridge that is just behind the upper teeth and alveolar ridge. This is referred to as alveolar place of articulation. It is a feature of the first and the last consonants in the word did. There is a further possibility for contact between the tongue and the roof of the mouth that is used in most languages. The back of the tongue body contacts the region near the back of the roof of the mouth near the structure called the velum. This is called velar place of articulation. It is a feature of the first and last consonants in the word gag. But this is not the only possibility for how the voicing, the beginning and the end of the contract can be timed. When the stop consonant comes at the beginning of the word, we get a different effect when the voicing begins after the release of the contact. Listen to the difference between the words bay and pay. Similarly, at the end of the word, the effect is different if the voicing ends before the contact or roughly at the same time as the contact. Compare add and at. The dimension that distinguishes these pairs of words from each other is called voicing. For the moment, we will consider only two values for this dimension that is voiced and voiceless. But voicing is actually more complicated than this. Just as English has voice stops at the bilabial, alveolar and velar places of articulation, it also has voiceless stops at these places. So far all of the consonants we have looked at have involved a complete closure of the vocal tract blocking air from passing out. But this is not the only way to make consonants. In fact, we need a new dimension for the various possibilities. Yes, a whole cluster of dimensions. This is called manner of articulation. One crucial variable within manner of articulation is the distance between the articulators. For stops, the closure is complete, but there are two further possibilities. Stops and fricatives are different manners of articulation. Consider what happens when you bite your lower lip with your upper teeth and then blow air out. <laughs> Unless you are biting too hard, some of the air can pass between your teeth and lip creating a sound like that at the beginning and the end of the word five. A sound made like this with an incomplete or approximate closure that permits air to pass through and produces a noisy sound due to the resulting turbulence is called fricative. The fricative at the beginning and end of the word five is voiceless because the fricative sound is not accompanied by voicing. That is, the voicing starts after the vocal tracks are opened up for the vowel and stops just before the closure made again at the end of the word. Students, hold your nose and say any word that comes to your mind. Say the same word without holding your nose. Hold your nose again. Do not see the difference in sound. 
they did notice the dominant sound of n and b when you hold your nose. Yes, this is the nasal sound. We have now seen voiced and voiceless consonants and the classification based on the placement of the particulars. It is amazing, is it not? How deep the language runs. Let us now see the other manner of airflow other than nasal and fricatives, obstruent. They are produced with obstructed vocal tract. They include fricatives, affricates and stops, sonorant. They are produced with relatively open vocal tract. Approximants, they are produced with relatively open oral tract. Strident, they are produced by directing air flow against the surface. It creates considerable friction. Sibilant, it is a subset of strident. They produce hissing and huzzing sounds. Well, students, now you know the different sounds produced by consonants. From here on, pay attention to every word you say and classify them. This will be a fun activity. Now, let us talk about semi vowels. Students, we have seen vowel sounds and consonant sounds. We shall now see about semi vowels. Semi vowels are also called semi consonants. You have realized by now that all the classification we are dealing with are entirely based on the sounds. So, with the term semi vowel, one must not confuse them with vowels. In contrast to vowels, semi vowels produce a shorter sound. It is a vowel like sound that acts like a consonant. Can you think of an example to support what we just studied? No? Well, let me give you an example then. The letter Y in the word L is a semi vowel sound, diphthong. In phonetics, a vowel in which there is a noticeable sound change within the same syllable. Diphthong is basically a vowel sound in which the tongue changes position to produce the sound of two vowels. A single sounding vowel is called monophthong. The process of moving from one vowel sound to another is called gliding and thus another name for diphthong is gliding wall. While diphthongs seem quite complicated to comprehend, they are probably the easiest of the lot. If you say the word hat and lip, you can hear the vowel sound in each is singular in nature. That is, each contains only one kind of sound. But if you say the words out, bite and toil, you will hear that the vowel sound of each, though restricted to one syllable, is composed of two different kinds of sound. These dual vowels are called diphthongs, literally two voices or two sounds as opposed to the singular vowels, which are monophthongs, one voice or one sound. If there are three vowel sounds within a syllable, they are called triphthongs. Triphthongs have not been associated much with English as yet. While concluding, I would like to say in this chapter, we dealt with the foundation of linguistics, the organization of sounds or sound systems. The organization of sound systems is also called phonology. It is concerned with the distribution and patterns of speech sounds in a particular language or in languages in general. We saw how speech is very different and more intricate than written language. We then saw that the building block of the phonology is acoustic phonetics. We then saw the different classes of sound in detail. Now you know that the different classes or consonants, walls, semi vowels and diphthongs. Next, we learned the vowel sounds in detail. There are 12 vowel sounds produced by the vowels. We then saw that keeping many factors in mind, the vowel sounds are classified into various categories. They are classified based on the position of the tongue as front, center and back. They are classified based on the height of the tongue as high, 
intermediate and low. They are classified based on the length as long and short. Based on the use of lips, they are classified as rounded and retracted. And based on the stress given, they are classified as tension lax. Next, we learnt about the sounds produced by consonants. We learnt that they are classified based on airflow, manner of articulators and on the position of articulator like vocal cords, vellum, etc. We then briefed through semi vowels, which is also known as semi consonants. Students, we learnt with an example what a semi vowel is. It is basically a consonant giving a vowel like sound. In the last topic, we saw that diphthongs or gliding vowels, that is, two vowel sounds within the same syllable. This is what we dealt with in the organization of sounds, which is known as phonology. Thank you. Thank you.